Since there are many of you who are not here this morning, uh, let me reintroduce Dr. Benny. Um, Robert Benny is the Jordan Trexler Professor of Religion um, Emeritus and founding director of the Robert D. Benny Center for Religion and Society at Roanoke College in Salem, Virginia. Uh, um, uh, Dr. Benny was the Jordan Trexler Professor and Chair of the Department of Religion and Philosophy at Roanoke College for 18 years. And before that, he was Professor of Church and Society at the Lutheran School of Theology in Chicago for 17 years. A native of Nebraska, Benny earned his MA and PhD from the University of Chicago Divinity School. Uh, I was there at this, uh, overlapping a tiny bit, uh, but I was an undergrad at the University of Chicago and he was a PhD student. He's been a Fulbright scholar to Germany. He's done postdoctoral um, research at, at Hamburg University in Germany, at Cambridge University in England, where he continues as a visiting fellow at St. Edmund's College. He's authored 12 books. Uh, the one that probably put him first on the theological map, uh, published back in the 70s, was titled The Ethic of Democratic Capitalism, A Moral Reassessment. It came out about the same time as Michael Novak's Spirit of Democratic Capitalism. Unfortunately, Novak's book eclipsed Benny's, but the, um, some of the critics, particularly the economists, said that, Benny, that Benny's book was better than Michael Novak's book. Uh, he published, another book he published was The Paradoxical Vision of Public Theology for the 21st Century, 1995. He's published a book on film uh, titled Seeing is Believing. Uh, he's published a book on Christian higher education that's has gotten a lot of notice and has gotten him invited to many, many campuses to speak about what it means to do Christian higher education. It's titled Quality with Soul, How Six Premier Colleges and Universities Keep Faith with Their Religious Traditions. And by the way, that and, and, and two other books, including Good and Bad Ways to Think About Religion and Politics, from which these lectures are taken, are on sale tonight at a book table. Go right through those doors, and you can get these books at discount prices. And we hope a lot of you go through those doors after this talk and do that. Um, he's also, uh, a number of us got together and did a fest shrift for Bob, uh, in 2009 is titled A Report from the Front Lines, and that book is also available over there. Uh, um, now, Bob has written many articles and editorials and reviews for journals and newspapers. He's been a Fulbright Scholar, a Woodrow Wilson Scholar, Rockefeller Scholar, a University of Chicago Fellow, an American Association of Theological Schools grantee, a Franklin Clark Fry Fellow, a Siebert Foundation Fellow, a Virginia Laureate in Religion, a Louisville Institute Fellow, and a Senior Lilly Fellow. He and Joanna married in 1959. They're parents of four children and eight grandchildren. Now, I should say that uh, something that I, I appreciate about Bob when I was serving under him uh, when I taught at Roanoke College, was Bob loves sports. And he has quite a uh, sports history. He lettered in four sports at Midland College in Nebraska, football, basketball, track, and baseball. And he tells me that he pitched against Bob Gibson. He quarterbacked against Tom Osborne, who was the legendary coach of the Huskers. And he played against... Pat Fisher, Hall of Fame defensive back for the Washington Redskins. And he says he got beat by all of them. Um, now, as Dr. Taylor said, the theme of these two lectures is good and bad ways, or, or actually bad and good ways, bad and good ways to think about religion and politics. This morning, 
we heard about the bad ways, and you, tonight, for coming out, have the reward of hearing the best lecture on the good ways to think about religion and politics. So please welcome Dr. Benny. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Jerry, and uh, thanks for all the people who have made my visits so enjoyable and pleasurable. I have heard much about Beeson Divinity School uh, uh, from Jerry after he, he was stolen away from Roanoke College by Beeson. It was the only uh, call that would have, uh, he would have answered yes to, and he did, and he came here, and he's happy as a lark, so I hear a lot of good things about Beeson. And uh, one of the Beeson uh, products, uh, Miles Hickson, is associate pastor at our Lutheran Church in Roanoke. And he's kind of scarily competent. <laughs> he, uh, as, at 27 or 28, or maybe he's 30 now. Uh, anyway, it's incredible how well he preaches, how well he teaches, how he's absorbed Lutheran doctrines so well and uh, is a rostered pastor in both the North American Lutheran Church and the Anglican Church of North America. So I've heard all this great things about Beeson, and it's been just, just wonderful here to experience it firsthand. So thank you for the invitation and the gracious uh, welcome. This morning I uh, talked about bad ways to think about religion and politics, and I talked about two of them. One what I call separationism, where there's uh, an attempt to separate the interaction between religion and politics. And I'm most worried about those who are trying to keep politics free of dangerous religion. And there seems to be an atmosphere in the country uh, fueled by what one could call secular progressivism that uh, pushes or wants to push religiously based activity and arguments out of the public sphere and to keep religion private, to kind of defang it from any kind of engagement in the culture and in politics. And that was perhaps the most important example of keeping politics free of dangerous religion, but there's a tr many religious traditions, or at least uh, classical sectarian traditions, that don't want to engage in politics either from the religion side. So they are what I call keeping religion free of dangerous politics. But there's a, been a growing set of movements uh, that have kind of given up on the American project. They believe the culture has become decadent and that's reflected in our politics and that the proper strategy now is to disengage uh, politically and culturally and to rebuild uh, the Christian culture as a counterculture to uh, uh, the decadent uh, culture and politics that are around us. And, uh, uh, I'm concerned about them because I, I don't think that's the proper Christian response to the world around us. We're called to be responsible and engaged in all spheres of life. If we believe that God is sovereign and that we has callings as citizens, I think we continually engage. So that was one of the bad ways to separate religion and politics. The other bad way was what I called fusionism or fusion, where uh, religion is brought too closely to political parties, political agendas, political persons. And uh, some of that is what I call a cynical use of religion, where it's used politically uh, and, a, and fused in a, in a highly cynical way. Then there's a symbiosis of religion and politics in some ethnic national traditions, like the Russians and Russian Orthodox, and that's also a dangerous kind of fusion. And finally, there's the tendency or the temptation to think there's an easily, easy, straight line from core Christian convictions to political ideology or political choices. And that straight line then tends to fuse the church and the political agenda they have. Liberal Protestants have their own way of doing that. <clears throat> uh, I was a member of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and their advocacy offices uh, track the left wing of the Democratic Party. <laughs> What they promote and advocate for is simply the left wing uh, of the Democratic Party uh, agenda. And they would never admit to being uh, fused, but it does turn out that way. And I think that kind of close, too close a connection with uh, uh, political agendas by churches is very dangerous because it, uh, 
makes the church another interest group. And it takes the, it, it, it uh, secularizes the gospel to make it uh, a political instrument or, or it, it, it dashes the kind of radical and universality of the gospel. So I thought, called those bad ways. <clears throat> And uh, the, the critique was fueled by the observation of a lot of people make, taking those positions. So I wanted to write a book that uh, not only criticized that and identified those, but also proposed a better way. And I call that uh, critical engagement. And the closest I can get to, in terms of a kind of a famous book, uh, well, may, maybe isn't that famous, but... Uh, 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 Rusty Reno of First Things has a book called Resurrecting the Idea of a Christian Society. Sounds like a, a, a wisp of a hope, doesn't it? But uh, that's taken from T.S. Eliot, who wrote uh, the, uh, Ten Day Resurrecting the Christian Society. He wrote that in the dark days of uh, World War II. And he thought uh, Christianity could rebuild and could, should be engaged culturally and politically. So what I'm doing is uh, kind of taking that argument that we should be engaged, but trying to show how we would do that. And what you have before you, I hope you do have the handout because it's, it's kind of a complex diagram that'll help you to follow through what I'm arguing. And uh, it's kind of descriptive, the way I think a wise Christians actually engage in political life prudent, wise Christians, but it's also normative in the sense I'm arguing how Christians should proceed in their uh, engagement in politics. Now, on the left-hand side, with number one, you can talk about the great Christian traditions as mere Christianity or the great tradition. And of course, there's a whole wealth of Christian uh, moral themes uh, there's the Ten Commandments, there's natural law, there are the love commandments of Christ, there is covenant love, there's just seem, schemes of justice. So there's a whole well, well of uh, <clears throat> ethical and moral values in the great tradition in mere Christianity. <clears throat> One of the uh, tough things is to, to sift out those things that will be relevant to politics, because not everything, it's too much. What main themes will be relevant to politics. And here we're already taking a step where people would disagree. Many of you would sift out different key values from the great tradition or from mere Christianity than I have done. So number two, uh, I call pr principles relevant to politics. So you take the Bible, you take the Christian moral tradition, and I sift out three values that I think uh, help Christians, push Christians toward, and guide Christians toward political involvement. The first one I take from a man called Glenn Tinder, a political philosopher, Christian political philosopher, who wrote uh, Christianity and Politics, a marvelous book where he argues that the center of Western politics is the biblical vision of each person in the image, created in the image of God and redeemed by Christ. So they're special people. They're exalted, is his language, exalted people. And out of that sense of the value of human life created in the image of God, you get human rights, you get democratic procedures, you get the consent of the governed, you get a high view of, of human life, and you can't, as he says, you just can't ignore or use human life as a means. And that, he thinks, is the center of what democratic rights, democratic practices as have, have emerged in the West. That's the center of it. But Tinder also says that in classic Christian doctrine, human nature's fallen. So it's exalted and fallen. And so good politics have a way of taming the kind of self-interest of human life, the sinful self-interest. And so there's checks and balances, separation of powers, uh, protections of people, rights that they can appeal to. So Tinder thinks that's really the crucial element that comes out of the great Christian tradition that is applicable to politics at the very deep running uh, guidance system of politics. Now I put a second one, uh, particularly as kind of a Lutheran, that wants to make a sharp qualitative distinction between what politics can do and what Christ does. And in the Lutheran view, Christ is the great gift of God who brings salvation, and he brings it 
in a way that we're totally receptive to it. We do nothing to earn our salvation. Before God, no one can stand. And Christ comes as a messenger and salvation of God and bestows upon us eternal life and salvation. And that's a whole different ball game than what happens in politics. What happens in politics are the left hand of God who preserves the world and engages in history to keep it from falling apart. But you don't have hopes that that left hand kingdom of politics is going to bring uh, the Messiah is going to be salvatory. It's not going to be salvatory. And uh, you're not going to be saving people by politics. <clears throat> and that's a hedge against the messianic politics that is a great temptation in the West. And, you, and when you say that to pe people now, that doesn't seem to strike many bells because we're all cynical about politics. <laughs> we, think, we think it's terribly fallen and no one's hoping for salvation through politics. But just think of what happened in the 20th century with the emergence of the Bolshevik uh, uh, revolution, substituting the classless society for the kingdom of God. And as Lenin said, you break a lot of eggs in order to make an omelet. And so you had millions of people killed in this utopian striving to bring the kingdom of God to, to earth. Horrible uh, effort to do that, a horrible uh, human uh, catastrophe. And a few years later, you get uh, the rise of the Nazis, who called their project the Third Reich. They were going to bring another kingdom of God to earth only for Aryan people. When I was on, as a Fulbright student, um, I visited uh, Nuremberg and saw the museum there where the Nazis had planned a museum where they would have on display the inferior races of the world. And they could, the Aryans could go by and look at the Slavs and the blacks and the browns and the yellows once the kingdom was established. Startling. And of course, they co-opted a lot of German Christians into that project so, and where, where the, the Lutheran Christians betrayed their own heritage of making this qualitative distinction. They, they thought of Hitler as a messiah. So I want to guard against that kind of value, uh, elevation of politics and distinguish it sharply from what Christ does. Thirdly, it seems to me that we're all called as Christians to serve the neighbor, not only in our family and marriage life, in our work, in the life of the church, but as citizens. And therefore, Christians ought to be a great salt and leaven in a political lump. That is, we ought to be engaged in a way that serves the neighbor through po political engagement. So I take those three things from my own Christian heritage and general Christian heritage and say, those are things I want to run with as I move into politics. But I would guess some people would choose quite a different set. Well, the third uh, concentric circle is, is what I call Christian social doctrine. That is what the church has come up with over the years that are social, social teachings. And Protestants are not very good at that because Protestants keep merging and dividing. <laughs> and they don't have a steady set of social teaching that goes over centuries. Catholics do. It changes imperceptibly or slowly over time. But Catholics have a very solid set of social doctrines that are of great benefit to Protestants. Catholics, with their adherence to natural law, simply cannot accept the marriage of a man and a, and a man. They simply cannot. <laughs> and so the social teachings of Catholicism are pr a pretty strong bulwark for Protestants uh, in terms of church doctrine, church teachings. Protestants, uh, as I said, are weaker on that. So when the, when the Pope writes an encycl 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 encyclical, people listen and they take it seriously, and that's part of Catholic social teaching. Lately, I've been encouraged by Orthodox Protestants getting together to make important statements that are listened to. So, for example, I believe, uh, uh, I believe Dean George was even involved in the statement, uh, male and female, he created them, to wrestle and critique the transgender movement that is kind of sweeping American life and which Christians seem to have uh, no real weapons to fight with it. And I mean intellectual weapons, I don't mean weapons weapons. But here I think what we're going to f see in the future is the Orthodox gathering together with 
social statesmen, social teachings that are going to make a difference. I'm hoping for that. And, and uh, there's some evidence that that's happening. So you're guided by the teachings of the church. And when you look back, there's some great social teachings like the just war theory. I can, as a Christian, I can use that and get, grasp that as a way to decide about whether a war is just or not. So there's great social teachings in the Christian tradition that help guide your political choices. Now I put a, an arrow there midway to show how complex things really become. That when you try to move from the Bible and the Christian tradition, sifting out relevant political principles, uh, relying at least on some sense on Christian t social teachings, then you have all these other factors that kind of insinuate themselves into your political decision making and the way, way you come up politically or you come down politically. And I tried to list some of them. It's, a, it's quite a bunch. For example, uh, a lot of people vote their self-interest politically. And all this Christian stuff isn't going to make much difference if they just vote. I don't think Christians can simply vote their self-interest. I think we have to have a much larger view of uh, po the political task. Uh, enlightened self-interest. Some people vote politically because they don't want revolutions. <laughs> they don't want the poor to rise up and, and, and make a revolution. But one thinks of your own family culture and history. And um, my parents were Nebraskans out of the Depression years, and one characterized uh, uh, Nebraskans as conservative anarchists <laughs> where they don't want the government to fool with your life but to have a very traditional culture <laughs> and I must say I've, I, I fought against that about 10 years of my life and I find myself returning to that <laughs> more often than I would like to think my, the politics of my parents uh, fa uh, but, but just think of regional culture and history Boy, people think differently about politics in the Southeast than they do in the Northeast or on the West Coast. It really shapes how you move across that, that uh, chart. Uh, national culture and history. Uh, Europeans think so differently about politics than Americans do. We have the American civil religion that we draw upon to make political choices. Uh, Europeans don't have anything like that and they can't understand it, why the president says, God bless America, at the end of a, an address. Or Martin Luther King draws upon the civil religion of equality to, to lead the civil rights movement. Uh, it's it's uh, a remarkable and unusual set of principles that are operative in America. In Western civilization, all the different ways we look at politics, the theories of justice, judicial philosophies, all of those are part of the Western civilization. And I've not even gotten to the most important one that probably in universities are most looked at. That is race, how that affects our movement across the, the, uh, the chart. Um, and class, how class affects our political judgments. And how uh, gender, women vote differently than men often. And how that affects political choice and marital status. Married people vote differently politically than uh, single people do. So those are all intervening factors that make it even more complex as you move from core Christian principles to political decisions. And then, part, uh, well, uh, peer group culture, where you're around and everybody's the same political opinion and the pressure that is to conform to that. When I was teaching in seminary in Chicago, I had kind of a conversion, not a religious conversion, but a conversion out of left-wing politics to more conservative views. And that was really hard to do because everybody expected me to hew the line that I had been following and that the, group, that the faculty followed. So the enormous peer group pressure that affects us politically and intensity of religious practice. People who go to church weekly have different political profiles and contours than those that don't go at all. And the religious tradition that you're a part of, whether you're a Mennonite, would make a huge difference politically as well, or if you're a Catholic. So there's all these factors that complexify our political life and our political decision making. And then uh, circle four is the engagement of issues that come to us unbidden and which have not been wrestled with before. 
and we have to try to sort out, given all those one, two, three, uh, and all the intervening factors, we have to come to a kind of Christian judgment individually on all these kinds of issues. Should have America gone to the war to, into the Iraq war? Should, uh, should we embrace gene editing or the cloning of humans? And why shouldn't we? How about can a man marry a man? Or should we embrace the transgender movement by being pastoral to people who feel trapped in the wrong body? How about poverty? What should we do about people who can work but don't? What should we do about uh, economic policy? <clears throat> about energy? Should we push hard for renewable energy or should we go with natural gas? Uh, all these things uh, which we come to us as Christian individuals, we have to make up our minds about them. And all the moving across the, uh, the, those concentric circles complexify things and, and, and make it uh, difficult to have a full agreement. So when I get to number five, that's political decision, politi public policy, I've complexified enough to, to argue that with each step, Christians of goodwill and intelligence differ. And they wind up in a lot of different political places for most issues. So there isn't such thing as uh, very few things that you could call Christian policies or Christian positions on uh, issues. There isn't a Christian position on the minimum wage. There's not a Christian position on uh, who should represent us politically. Uh, although there's certainly Christian preferences and individual Christians have to make up their minds as they go across each one of these uh, uh, concentric circles. So for most issues, it's a jagged path where Christians of goodwill and intelligence differ. And uh, they can grant each other a lot of freedom to, and tolerance uh, on the way they come down politically. Uh, for example, uh, I was teaching an adult class uh, during the run-up to the 19, 2016 election, and it was electric because uh, Trump was a very, very controversial candidate. And we found out that if everybody was pretty much on the page politically, uh, theologically, and most of them were classic Orthodox Christians, we were able finally to begin talking about choices about Trump. And there were people in the room who were Hillary supporters that could actually talk, reveal how they were going to vote without stirring a big fuss or without fisticuffs breaking out. <laughs> and uh, there were lots of people who uh, couldn't vote for him, wanted to vote for a third party. Uh, some of them said, I'm going to hold our nose and vote for Trump. And then there were some exuberant Trump supporters. But what was really interesting was that because we were on the same wavelength as Christians, we could tolerate each other's political opinions. So that's a good example for me of how jagged and indirect the movement is and that we've got to grant each other a lot of freedom politically. That's a major point. But a second major point is that there are limits to that. There are some things that are so wicked, policies that are so wicked that we have to say no to them, that rule them out of bounds <clears throat> from a Christian point of view, not only the church but individuals deciding they're out of bounds. And of course, there's some good historical examples of that. Racism in America, it took a long time for Christians to sort that out, but finally argued it's so wicked that we cannot no longer participate in, in legal segregation. Torture. Uh, some of the things that were done in earlier generations, uh, medical experimentation without consent, those sorts of things we think now are so wicked that uh, they c we cannot entertain them as Christians politically. And when, uh, so we had major examples of that in the rise of Nazism with Bonhoeffer in 1933 when the Nazis enacted the Aryan Paragraph which meant that anybody of Jewish blood could not serve in the civil service and therefore they couldn't be pastors, even though we were Christians, if they had Jewish blood. Bonhoeffer saw that beyond the pale of what Christians should accept politically. And he began and conspired and worked with an underground church that was heroic in its response. It took a lot longer for people to, to see the evil 
that was emerging and how wicked that was that led to a huge sec Second World War. So there are things that we, and, and it takes a lot of political wisdom and the, religious wisdom to discern which ones are those so far out of bounds that they just, we just have to say no to them as Christians. But that's the second mage point. There are limits. <laughs> we can engage in a lot of pluralism politics as Christians because of the complexity of coming to political choice, but there are some things that are dramatically out of bounds. But the third thing I want to argue is that Orthodox Christians should find a lot of commonality in the general direction in four different areas. And I put those underneath. Uh, the first one I would argue is that Christians, because we believe that all life is human life is created in the image of God, and that God is the sole uh, provider and sovereign of our lives, that Christians should resist uh, taking innocent life, nascent life, strongly resist that, and Christians should resist the kind of physician-assisted suicide that's coming along pikes. So the beginning of life and the end of life, we should be able to agree on that. And I would hope even in the liberal Protestant denominations, could agree on that. I have less hope that they will. But I'm trying to make the argument that they should. <laughs> there should be agreement on, on that one. The second one that maybe is even more compelling is what I, it was the preservation of religious liberty. One of the great gifts of American life is the free exercise of religion, which means not only having freedom in your private religious life, but be able to exercise your religion culturally and politically and publicly. And that, it seems to me, is absolutely crucial politically in this country. And that's perhaps why 83% or 81% of evangelicals voted for Trump. Not that they thought he was a, a Christian exemplar, but that he was going to promise that his first choice in Supreme Court justice would be one who respected religious liberty. And so that's an extremely important thing for Christians that I would hope liberal Christians as well as conservative Christians would say yes to. So politically you want to gain, have a Christian voice to preserve uh, religious freedom and, and liberty. I think also uh, a safety net for the poor, that's such a crucial Christian conviction to be caring for the poor, not only in our own voluntary association, person hand-to-hand -hand care for the poor, but also governmentally. So some of them are easy cases, like uh, wounded veterans. Why wouldn't we support them strongly from a governmental point of view? Children, children don't know, choose the conditions of life, and it seems to be important governmentally to support children. Uh, much more complex when you get to uh, people who don't work and how we should uh, provide them from a governmental point of view. How about medical care? Should that be a universal right, or should it be a, a, a means-tested right? Uh, those, those are tough questions and not so easy calls, but nevertheless, I think as Christians we want the government politically to offer a safety net that's a very, that's a very important Christian thing. And I added down for number four, uh, support for the traditional notion of marriage and the natural family. But that's probably perhaps right now a political dead end, uh, at least in terms of reversing the Supreme Court decision on, on marriage. But there's still many political ways to support marriage and the natural family and, and natality. Uh, we now have a, a, a birth ratio of 1.77, uh, the number of children uh, childbearing women will have, which is far below the replacement rate. 205 is the replacement rate. And many European countries, seeing the demographic catastrophe that they're facing, are encouraging uh, uh, birth and the care for children uh, a lot. As uh, one quipster put it, uh, let's make America mate again. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the point of this whole thing is, is that uh, it's a complex matter to come to political choice. There are limits to it, and there are some places where Christians ought to agree. And I would guess most of us in the room would agree with the four that I have, but you have, might have 
additional ones or whatever, but I would guess we would have a lot of consensus in room about religious freedom, about the protection of life at the beginning and at the end, and support for traditional marriage, and I think we would all support some sort of government safety net for those who cannot contribute to society. So anyway, that's the Christian argument. Now the next uh, page, and I have to do this quickly, Jerry, uh, is the practical engagement of organized religious tradition with politics. And these are what you could call cool and hot connections. And I've tried to think through what's the best way for organized religious traditions to affect politics. And the first two are what I call indirect, where the church itself as institution doesn't try to affect politics directly. Uh, and the first one is what I call the ethics of character. That is, if the church is really the church, it forms the heart and virtues. And it, uh, become, those become habits of the heart. And the church conveys a worldview that helps people, when they get in the public sphere, to make discriminate choices, good choices, and hopefully Christian choices. And when the church is really church and, and, and affects people that much, they really change the culture over time. And uh, we have a great challenge now as Christians to form those kind of strong lay people who can engage their way with weapons of the Spirit in a world where the culture is deteriorating and politics kind of follows suit from the culture of deterioration. So we really need strong countercultural emphasis, disciplined Christians. That's uh, Rod Dreher's uh, proposal in the Benedict Option, and that we need as Christians to regroup and strengthen our churches and strengthen our ways to reach our young and to form them deeply so that when they enter the world and engage the world, they will come as serious, well-formed Christians. I call that unintentional. You're not intending, church is not intending to change politics, but it forms people deeply and they make a great effect. Think of the Christian politicians, well-formed Christians who then become political service. Boy, that is really important to have that kind of political inf impact by well-formed political characters. I call the ethics of conscience the effort by the church within the church to help lay people engage the social teachings of the church and the teachings of the church in relation to the challenges that are coming. Just a quick example, when uh, the first Iraq war happened, uh, our church uh, had adult conversation about the uh, Christian theory of a just war that comes from Augustine and is all the way down the Christian tradition. And one Sunday we had, first of all, I, I laid out the theory of just war. One Sunday we had somebody who thought the invasion was just and he argued it out from the just war theory. The next Sunday we had somebody who thought it was unjust and he argued it out from that point. But what the, and we didn't take any position. But the point was that the Christians were engaged with the social teachings of the church and a particular issue. And we can do that in many ways, and we do that many ways within the church to awaken the conscience of lay people, to help them to connect Sunday and Monday. Those are important things that are called the ethics of conscience. Uh, the church also s uh, spins off a number of voluntary associations. Serious Christians, well-formed Christians, when they see an issue com coming down the pike, they engage in voluntary associations and organize. So at the great march on pro-life march on Washington last week or two weeks ago, people carried banners from thousands of voluntary associations. I mean, it was stunning how many voluntary associations are organized by Christians to pr push the uh, pro-life cause. And the church has had a history of doing that. It did that by starting hospitals, it started universities, orphanages, colleges. All of this was Christians gathering together in voluntary associations to do the work they thought was important publicly. And of course, that same kind of witness happens through voluntary associations in politics. Uh, the, some of that's what I call social pioneering. Well, those are cool directions. That is, they're indirect, and the church doesn't try to coerce or even persuade. It works through the lay people, forming them well so they go into the world. There's direct uh, in, uh, engagement with politics by churches, organized church bodies, which I call hot connections, 
which are more high risk. Uh, first one is the church's social conscience, where the church makes uh, statements, arguments. I just re- referenced them a couple minutes ago when I talked about the uh, statement by Orthodox Christians, male and female. He, he created them. Catholic encyclicals are very important examples of this kind of persuasion, social statements of the church. And uh, perhaps uh, they don't take specific positions often, but they point to great challenges and they call for uh, government action or political action on this particular issue. Um, By the way, social pioneering, one of the things that's happening now, we have all this recidivism problem in prisons and the prison fellowship does a great job of preventing recidivism. Now what's going to happen, it seems to me, is that's going to be copied by more public programs that are funded politically. And that's been the Western history where the church picks it up. Universities, they were all Christian at the beginning. And they, the government then picks them up and funds them, changes their nature, unfortunately, in some examples. Well, the final one is what I call the church with power. This is the church's conscience. Uh, and, and it still uses persuasion, the word persuasion. But the church with power tries to exert power directly. And of course, the Reformation had his one aim is to get the Catholic Church out of political power because the Catholic ages were one in which the church exercised political power. And Luther thought that was illegitimate from a Christian point of view that the church only had the power of the word. So that is really high stakes when the church gets directly involved in political power in the community organizations, for example, that use conflict methods. Good way to split churches. But uh, in some, because lay people generally don't think the church should be involved in course of power, probably a pretty good uh, inclination that it shouldn't be directly involved in political power. But uh, Catholics, even after they've given up the idea that they're to direct whole society, have had a history of intervening uh, with power. Uh, they uh, helped depose Marcos in, in Philadelphia, in the um, Philippines, and uh, Pope John Paul II, when he went to Poland, gathered up the power of those trade unions, and it was a way to, to uh, make the communist empire fall in Poland. So uh, there are rare times, it seems to me, where the church can get involved in that kind of political coercion, but those are fairly rare, and they're high-risk kind of things. Let me end with this. The indirect method, at least from my point of view and the Lutheran point of view, is preferred. It prefers distance between the transcendent claims, the Word of God, and political life, honors the callings of laity, political callings, uh, political figures, preserves church's moral authority when it drinks from its own wells, avoids the danger of politicizing the church or embarrassing it because of lack of competence. Great quote from C.S. Lewis. The application of Christian principles, say, to trade unions or education must come from Christian unionists or Christian schoolmasters, just as Christian literature comes from Christian novelists and dramatists, not from a bench of bishops getting together to write plays and novels in their spare time. So uh, uh, he pleads for kind of an indirect through the laity to affect the culture and politics. So I believe the indirect approach demands far more attention. We have to form people much more strongly so that they can be leaven and salt as they engage the public world. Uh, But even so, the religious factor in political life is enormous. Even though we've been pretty weak in forming people, we still have a lot of clout in political life, and we shouldn't give that up, but we should focus on the indirect ways to to, uh, witness politically. So that's my spiel. We'll be happy to have some questions uh, uh, as Jerry's going to monitor this. <clears throat> Was that a, a better way than this morning? Well, yeah, well, well I think so. <laughs> I think so. Uh, how about the rest of you, though? Uh, yeah. uh, question from somebody. Uh, we've got two students on either side of in, in the red coats, so they'll hand you a microphone. Not white coats, but red coats. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, yeah, my question has to do with, like, I uh, guess, it's kind of related to the current political climate. This is kind of old hat, I guess. But an organization like One Million Moms, I'm sure people are, you know, fairly 
familiar with a group like that, boycotting somebody like uh, Target, right, for their, their, their stance on transgender bathrooms and things like that. <clears throat> While it might uh, have some kind of effect on, like, uh, you know, a, some current economic pushback on Target with, with, their, with their policies, I mean, it seems like that could, re, you know, react fundamentally in the wrong direction in some way, form, or fashion. So I just want to know your thoughts on those kind of movements specifically, because... Which uh, movements again? Uh, now, this is um, one million moms who oh. are wanting to boycott Target because of its transgender bathrooms. Oh, so I didn't even know about that. About that? <laughs> well, if it's a voluntary association spun off by Christians, I have no objection to that. I, and voluntary associations, those can do the straight line thinking that I was critical of for churches. Churches shouldn't do that. But I think voluntary, it's let a thousand uh, flowers bloom when it comes to voluntary associations. And, and so uh, there are Lutherans for life that are really engaged heavily in political pressure, but it's not the church that's doing it. I think if the church does it, it then really draws that straight line that is very dangerous for the church's life. It's not so dangerous for society, but it compromises, I think, uh, the universality of the gospel where it's making, uh, it's making judgments about who, who, who is really living the Christian life and who isn't. And I think that's, that's uh, uh, a dangerous thing for the church to do. I'm th I, was, I thought you might be talking about the, uh, the movements to boycott Israel, uh, boycott sanctions and divestment. And a couple of mainline churches have adopted that strategy. And boy, is that dynamite. Because what you're doing is you're really being coercive as a church toward public policy toward Israel. And uh, it'd be much more healthy for a voluntary station to do that and not the church, uh, because that'll really bring conflict into a church. And I think compromises ca uh, Christian teaching of, of a central sort about the nature of salvation, about the nature of Christian life. Okay, a um, second question. Jared. Now we can't hear. This is a little related to the previous question, but I've heard a lot of people in the past election cycles say that they're going to make their decision not just based on what they think will be the policy outcomes based on voting for this particular person or what type of moral world will be created by voting for this person, but they're thinking about the reputation it will give Christians and therefore the gospel. And so Voting by to, uh, for voting for this person, he may create a more moral system of laws, but because he's so reprehensible, he's going to hurt the gospel and its proclamation among non-believers. Do you think that that's legitimate to take that into consideration? Well, are you talking about uh, hurting the, the church because uh, Trump, for example, is viewed as a Christian? Right, Trump or Roy Moore here in Alabama. So because evangelicals are voting for these people, it makes uh -huh. Christianity look bad and it hurts the gospel. Well, I think, uh, as this morning we talked a little bit about that, if you fuse uh, Christian leaders too closely to political power, someone like Trump, then I think you're really uh, damaging your religious tradition uh, or the organized religious tradition. So I wince when Falwell at Liberty University uh, cozies up way too much to Trump. Uh, so that bothers me if you get that kind of endorsement, uh, particularly a kind of controversial endorsement of controversial character. Uh, he, uh, Falwell should stand a little clearer, although uh, a Liberty student uh, here at Beeson told me today that on the other hand, he invited Hillary and he invited Sanders and he invited other people to come to Liberty, but he, he still, it seems to me, is a little bit too close. I think the more difficult question is when you have a person with character defects, but is producing political effects that you like, how do you balance the two of those? Does the fact that Trump has a, a dubious character uh, mean that you, you can't vote for him or won't support him, even though some of the effects he's done with the policies, 
you, you really agree with. That is, a, is it, does the character question finally trump the policy issue and how the policy is falling out? I think that's a really interesting and difficult question. Um, my pastor at Roanoke just simply cannot support Trump because of the character problem. Uh, but I, on the other hand, can. <laughs> I have more tolerance for ambiguity. Uh, he has less, uh, a lot less tolerance for ambiguity. That's part of his strength, right? <laughs> he doesn't tolerate ambiguity. <laughs> Let me intervene and ask a question because I know uh, how Bob thinks on this, and I think it'd be very helpful to hear his answer. Um, my question is this, uh, is it the best thing for, for a Christian when he goes to the ballot box uh, after having studied the candidates to say, I'm gonna vote, f uh, I'm, uh, I'm gonna study the character of each candidate. I'm an independent and, and I'm gonna vote on the basis of character, not party and not political policy so much, but individual character. Yeah, I'd, I'm more on the policy side uh, than the character. Uh, Luther was purported to have said, I would rather be governed by a wise Turk than a foolish Christian, even though the Christian might be pious. So part of it depends on what kind of policy you're pursuing and how well you can do it. Uh, so um, uh, when we were discussing in that class I talked to you about, uh, uh, the, the ones that finally voted for Trump did so f because of his promise about uh, a Supreme Court justice, and he paid off on that immediately. So it's a quandary we're in when the, these character problems are so, so uh, obvious <laughs> and so public, and that makes it even more difficult for me because I wince a lot about his tweeting and, and uh, all the uh, outrageous things he says. But you know what kind of qualifies it for me? And now we're getting into the complex, jagged character of making a political decision. Uh, what, what kind of character do you think behind the scenes LBJ was? What kind of language do you think he used in private conversations about African countries? What do you think? We already know. <laughs> we already know these things. Yeah, well, yeah, we do. But we didn't know them then. No. And what do you think were the character structure of of John Kennedy and how he treated women. Yeah, you know these. It was pathological. Yeah. And that was all hidden. Trump is right up in front. <laughs> no, no, uh, no hiddenness. So I, I think uh, probably that on the character question, we've had a lot of presidents that are not sterling characters, but in fact uh, had good political effects. And uh, so it's, it's a really complex, and that's where I say the jaggedness and complexity of coming to political decision uh, really is that, that there's not a Christian choice. Uh, Christians disagree on these things, and we should grant each other a lot of tolerance <clears throat> on these sorts of issues and not move to anger and denunciation when we disagree with another Christian's point of view on these things. Uh, we've got... Time for, for one more question. Uh, over Here's here, one. oh, Waters. Um, my question pertains to Christianity as it has been portrayed as becoming more of a minority voice. Uh, Russell Moore used the term uh, prophetic minority. Mm -hmm. And um, you mentioned um, uh, James Davidson Hunter this morning, and I know that he, uh, in his book, To Change the World, talks about this as well. So how would you, uh, how would you, or what advice would you give to, if this is the case, that progressive secularism um, is, is the larger dominant and that it's, you know, it's no longer, um, America is no longer this great Christian nation. You think of, you know, Reagan era and these kind of Times, what would you say that the Christian, how does the Christian voice need to speak as a minority and what advantages does that bring? What disadvantages? How do we make that transition well if that is the case? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, you know, I think about the um, African American church and how they were a minority but they fought for civil liberty and, um, mm -hmm. and that, again, some of the things they were, did uh, from the minority perspective um, was actually really helpful. And so, just thinking along those lines. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I think that, uh, that there's a lot of wisdom to Dreyer's sense of uh, rebuilding Christians as a counterculture. I mentioned this morning uh, this, uh, uh, some empirical evidence that the 20% of serious Christians in America is not, not shrinking but growing. And what's happening is the casual Christians are departing. And the casual Christians that were once part of the main line and part of the elite are no longer connected with those traditions and have become more hostile to particularly classical Christianity. So there's been a shifting there, but I think, and the, and the counterpoise is that Christians who are serious about Christianity might be growing. And I think that's hopeful. And as I mentioned, America has a history of revivals. And if the culture continues to deteriorate and we can provide a really wholesome uh, counterculture, we might have quite a different uh, possibility in this country culturally. Now, you asked the the political question. Uh, I'm right there with Reno that uh, serious Christians have a lot of clout yet and that they band together in voluntary associations and politically it's very visible the clout that we have Uh, because uh, uh, intensity of religious conviction is one of the top three factors of how you vote. It really is important. And the more intense you are religiously, and here's the dangers of fusion, the more conservative you are politically. And I, I, I worry about that a little bit because serious Christians seem to be being driven into the Republican Party because of its stance on pro-life, on religious liberty, not on care for the poor, the liberal, the progressives are pretty good on that one, but the traditional marriage. So, so uh, if uh, we're indeed uh, growing along that way and more serious, uh, all you have to do is get who's elected. So politics is quite different than the commanding heights of the culture where the education institutions, the universities are pretty much under secular progressive control. The media are, Grammys and what are all these (laughs) celebrations about films and all that are obviously uh, heavily uh, conditioned by secular progressivism. But politically it doesn't happen that way. So I think um, there's hope that a strong Christian minority will have political impacts that uh, are visible and may be strengthened as this we strengthen our own internal life as churches. Hope so, anyway. So nice, nice, nice to leave on an optimistic note. Uh, we need a little optimism these days. Uh, let me remind you that we've got a book table just, on, just through that door there. I encourage you to go and take a look at the books for sale, all by Dr. Benny. Thank you very much for, for, for coming tonight. Have a good evening. Thanks for coming out. Yeah.